All right. So our next session will come from the team at Yelp. It'll be about least privileged Kubernetes authorization with OPA, and it's sponsored by Sunray. Sunray Security delivers an enterprise identity and data governance platform for AWS, Azure, GCP, and Kubernetes. Thank you, Sunray. And over to the team at Yelp, Charlie, Daniel, and Quinn. Before we start, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all the forward CloudSec organizers for giving us the opportunity to share our story with you all. Charlie, Quentin, and I work on the security team at Yelp. Today we're here to tell you about how we utilize the Open Policy Agent and Active Directory to provide fine-grained role-based access control to the Kubernetes infrastructure at Yelp. Let's start with the motivation for this work. If you're not familiar with Yelp, it's a company that connects people with great local businesses. As of the end of 2020, Yelpers have contributed over 224 million reviews on our platform. Approximately 31 million unique devices access Yelp every month on average, and more than half a million business locations spent money on Yelp ads every month on average last quarter to promote their businesses. As you can imagine, it takes a lot of infrastructure to support an application of that scale. Today we have more than a thousand geographically distributed software engineers across a hundred different teams. We have a containerized microservice architecture managed by an open source platform as a service framework we built called Pasta. Under the hood, Pasta uses Kubernetes as the con container orchestration framework to manage thousands of workloads. We have a few dozen Kubernetes clusters that we run on EC2, with several custom namespaces where we run our web microservices and batch jobs, and other types of stateful workloads, such as Cassandra clusters, Kafka, Flink, Spark, and various other use cases. But we weren't always using Kubernetes. In fact, it's a relatively new technology for us at Yelp. As early adopters to the whole containerized workload scene, we had been using Mesos as our container orchestration framework since 2014. Our Mesos infrastructure was primarily used for running services and batch workloads in containers. We didn't really have a strong need for fine-grained access control on the Mesos clusters because in that context, only the infrastructure team needed to interact with Mesos directly, and they did so using shared secrets with administrative privileges. Workload developers used an abstraction layer provided by the infrastructure team and didn't need to directly access, nor did they even need to worry about the underlying technology. In fact, most of them don't even know what Mesos was. Over time, Kubernetes gained a lot of, a lot of popularity in the co community, and we eventually decided as a company that we should migrate over to Kubernetes for its pluggable components, extensibility, and community support. The migration to Kubernetes unlocked a lot of new use cases for us beyond just running services and batch workloads. With this came, the interest, came lots of interest from other development teams within Yelp that wanted to leverage the Kubernetes infrastructure to support other types of workloads, such as Kafka, Cassandra, and various other use cases. These developers would need to interact with different namespaces and resources depending on their use case. Additionally, for the service and batch workload owners, they were excited to take advantage of the Kubernetes CLI to do more sophisticated types of debugging that were not possible in the Mesos infrastructure, such as remotely execing into their service container to investigate issues live in production. Unfortunately, the security model that we used in the Mesos world was directly ported over to the Kubernetes world, which, in hindsight, doesn't really make a lot of sense given all the new use cases and participants in the ecosystem. This was problematic because it meant that all Kubernetes users got administrative access to all the Kubernetes clusters via a shared client certificate for the cluster admin role, regardless of how much permissions they actually needed. And to access that client certificate, these users had to be given pseudo access on the sensitive control plane nodes. This has some obvious disadvantages. One could easily make a mistake and accidentally modify or delete resources or namespaces that they shouldn't have even had access to in the first place. And with everyone sharing credentials, when something like that happens, it can be really difficult to understand exactly who performed which actions in the cluster. Additionally, this complicated our compliance narratives, and we had to do strange things to overcompensate, like creating completely separate bespoke Kubernetes clusters for sensitive workloads, which obviously is not ideal. So it's very clear that we need to introduce some fine-grained role-based access control. 
Let's consider our requirements. We want to authenticate users individually instead of relying on shared credentials. We'd like to define least privilege authorization rules for Kubernetes objects based on team ownership, resource sensitivity, action sensitivity, and infinitely many other combinations of custom taxonomies that exist in our infrastructure. And we need to enforce and maintain a formal paper trail for all changes to authorization policies and all group membership changes. For this project, we prioritize human users since there are lots of them with lots of use cases. And thankfully, we only had a handful of service users and they each had their own client certificates and non-administrative role bindings and RBAC configurations. So let's talk about the easy part, authentication. At a high level, we have human users authenticating using their Okta credentials. Kubernetes supports this basically outside of the box. Slightly more details of how this works. A human user runs a command like kubectl gets pods. We provide a wrapper script that first prompts the user for their Okta authentication, which consists of their Active Directory credentials and a second, second factor from a YubiKey or Authenticator app. Upon success, they receive a JOT token from Okta, which is valid for one hour and is then sent to the cluster via kubectl's dash dash token parameter. The Kubernetes API server then verifies the authenticity of the JOT token by verifying the signature using Okta's public key server. The human user's identity from the token is then propagated downstream for authorization considerations. The benefits of using Okta for authentication are pretty straightforward. Root access is no longer needed to interact with Kubernetes clusters. Each action can be tied back to a specific user rather than a generic administrative user and credentials obtained from Okta are temporary and behind a second factor. This mitigates the risk of credential theft and replay attacks. Now let's talk about authorization. Thankfully, Kubernetes has thought of everything. Kubernetes has a built-in mechanism for expressing authorization semantics called RBAC, which stands for Role-Based Access Control. It sounds like it's perfect for our requirements, right? Well, not exactly. RBAC would be appropriate for a relatively small number of workloads and a small number of teams that each operated within their own namespace. In our environment, we had thousands of workloads owned by hundreds of teams, and they all operate within a single namespace. Using RBAC to achieve the level of granularity that we, wanted, that we desired would be tedious and complex to the point that it just wouldn't be practical. Additionally, we have really strong opinions at Yelp about letting people define users group memberships and permission sets in YAML files in heavily used infrastructure as code repositories. We prefer a mechanism that allows us to ensure a formal security review and a formal chain of approval when permission scopes are changed. So we actually felt that RBAC could not meet our requirements and that we needed something more flexible. Thankfully, Kubernetes has another option for authorization called webhook authorization in which Kubernetes delegates authorization decisions to an external service. We could use the open policy agent as this external service and programmatically produce a policy bundle that leverages Active Directory to express user and group memberships. We could do some clever things with this to achieve our requirements without having to define hundreds of overly verbose role binding configurations. Now I'll hand it over to Quentin to go into the details of the authorization architecture. Thank you, Daniel. Here's an overview of the architecture. First of all, on the top, you've got the user who interacts with Kubernetes using kubectl. Kubernetes sends a request to open policy agent, which makes the authorization decision. And on the bottom, we've got the data that feeds into that decision. We collect data from Git and from Active Directory and then we put that data into an S3 bucket for Open Policy Agent to read. Let's talk about that data first. Here's a summary of all the data that feeds into OPA in order for it to make authorization decisions. First, the access control capabilities are stored in an access-restricted Git repository. These are the roles that we can give to a user to allow them to perform certain actions. We then use Active Directory to store group membership which tells OPA which users are able to use which capabilities. And then finally, we have service metadata that contains various information about the services that we run, 
that we may want to use for authorization. Next, let's talk about the policy. The OPA policy is the logic that OPA uses to take all of the data provided and make a decision. It is written in Rego, which is a language based on data log. I won't cover the details of the Rego policy, but I'll cover specific examples of what the input looks like. The capability format contains a number of different ways in which you can limit access. It currently contains clusters, namespaces, resources, subresources, resource names, verbs, pod metadata, and service metadata. These are all native Kubernetes attributes, except for the service metadata. A capability can have any number of sub-capabilities. Like in this example, we only have one called admin. These attributes are all structured as allow lists, where if you match any value, you are allowed, which means that an empty list means allow all. Here's an example capability with two sub-capabilities. The first allows you to run any command as long as the cluster is one of these two listed. And you can also run the list command, which sometimes looks like a git in kubectl, in any cluster. Therefore, these two sub-capabilities combine to create an unprivileged capability. In this example, we're using pod metadata to filter. Yelp.com slash service name is just a custom metadata attribute that we use to represent the name of the service that a pod is a part of. This will work if either of the two values match. Here's another example where using a team attribute to limit actions to only those where we can match the action to a service owned by the InfraSec team. You can also use a custom variable in the capabilities to represent the user's team rather than a static value. Here's a capability that lets someone run read-only commands for any service that their team owns. And here's the same capability, but without the read-only requirement. Next, I'll cover the OPA Policy Manager. This is a service that we use to compile all of the input data that OPA needs, bundle it up into a format that it can read, and push it to S3. It runs continuously and only updates the bundle when anything has changed. Now I'll cover the components that run on each Kubernetes host. OPA runs as a service on each host and is configured to pull from S3 to configure itself, as well as to listen on a WebSocket for any requests that come from Kubernetes. The input it gets from Kubernetes takes the form of a subject access review and that contains all the information about the user's request. It then combines that with the data from the S3 bundle to make a decision. These decisions are then logged and written into Splunk. Now we'll go over just a couple of end-to-end -end examples of how this can be used. First, we'll cover a basic example. In the top one, a user is trying to list pods in the default namespace. The list verb matches the specified verb in the capability the namespace and the resource don't have any restrictions in the capability, and the user is a member of the OPA Kubernetes Dev Unprivileged group. So this request is allowed. In the bottom example, the verb doesn't match and the request is denied. In these next two examples, we are using a team-based capability, which depends on the request matching with our service metadata. The subject access review only contains the name of the pod and so the first step is actually for OPA to request the pod metadata from Kubernetes. This pod metadata then contains the name of the service, and that service can be matched against our service metadata. In this case, the service is owned by InfraSec team, and the user making the request is also a member of that team, so the request is allowed. In the bottom example, the service name is now PE service, and so the, own, the owner no longer matches with the user's team and the request is denied. Note that we could still add a static value into the capability. If we added PE there, then the team would match again and the request would become allowed. Finally, I'm gonna talk about the decision logs briefly. Each authorization request uh, ends up with a log being recorded. This has, of course, the basic information like whether or not the result was allowed or denied, and also the various input in the subject access review that Kubernetes sent to OPA, uh, 
But what's really neat about it is that it shows you which groups would have been allowed versus which groups the user had. This makes it very easy for us to debug requests and to figure out what capabilities we should add to someone who needs to do something. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Charlie to talk about rollout strategy and system reliability. Thanks, Quentin, for the great technical deep dive. Let's talk about our rollout strategy. Our major challenge was switching to a new authorization system under a heavy usage. To avoid any system or user disruption, we came up with the following approach. First, we ensured that all of the changes are rollback safe. Then, we configured our infrastructure to support a dry run mode. Then, we rolled out the dry run mode incrementally, cluster by cluster. In this way, we were able to observe the actual usage patterns. Once we collected enough data, we provisioned least privilege authorization capabilities. Finally, we incrementally roll out the enforcement mode that enforces the least privilege authorization. One thing that I would like to emphasize here is that on every step, we overly communicated the rollout. For infrastructure changes, we let the SRE teams know on each step. For authorization provisioning, we communicated with the stakeholders. In this way, we were able to smoothly roll out our a major authorization system in our infrastructure. Now let's talk about uh, several challenges that we encountered throughout this project. One of the major challenges was that the subject access review did not contain enough information for us to make least privileged decisions. For example, we didn't have the service name that we use for the team-based authorization. As a solution, for each authorization request, OPA reaches out to Cube API server with the resource name and gets the resource labels including the service name. OPA also reads the uh, environment variables from the host to make authorization decisions based on the Kubernetes cluster or YAP ecosystem. Next problem was that unprivileged engineers who has network access can call to OPA API and modify the authorization policies. In this way, any unprivileged user could entirely bypass the authorization system. And this is really bad for our security posture. As a solution, we set up MTLS between Kubernetes and OPA. Additionally, we created an RBAC policy for OPA to only run GET commands in Kubernetes clusters. In this way, we aim to mitigate privilege escalation attacks through OPA. The next problem was that we encountered during the design process, which was that multiple teams owning services in a single namespace. In fact, one of our namespaces, namespaces contained hundreds of services on more than hundreds of teams. So, like we could have created a capability for each of these teams, but then we could have uh, have like hundreds of different capabilities. Instead, we came up with a special keyword called my team and created a single team-based policy. In this way, everyone who has the same team-based team policy can only access their own services. One thing I would like to mention uh, that here is that this couldn't be possible with the default Kubernetes RBAC policies, because RBAC policies do not provide such uh, granularity. The next problem that I would like to talk about is how do we associate the team with non-pod resources with metadata? So we previously talked about how we use pod metadata to associate a request with our own metadata, uh, service metadata to make team-based access but some uh, non-pod resources require special treatment. For example, secrets that are bound to the services that they do not have team membership associated with them. To enforce least privileged team-based access to the secrets, we came up with a special case handling in the regular policy. Literally, we say in our policy that our policy only allows team-based access for the secrets under the following conditions. The service should belong to the user's team, and all of the service's instances should also belong to the user's team. In this way, we can enforce team-based access for all types of resources. But as you can imagine, this came with a price. This approach made the 
regular policy long and overly complicated. And this brings us to our next problem, which uh, that our regular policy become overly complicated and hard to test and debug. So to, to make sure that uh, we have enough coverage, we wrote extensive test cases, uh, unit test coverage, uh, like in fact, we had unit test coverage more than 2000 lines of code. So these was overall problems and challenges that we encountered, encountered throughout this pro project. Let's talk about a little bit on the system reliability. As you have seen from the new architecture presentation, we actually added more complexity under the hood than in the status quo. As such, it was very important for us, uh, for our design and our rollout strategy to ensure that the system was fault tolerant to any failure scenarios. So let's go through some of these scenarios. First one is that what if uh, we push a bad policy that has a catastrophic side effects like blocking access from old users? We do enforce a strict code review process, but nobody is perfect after all, like uh, some bad thing might slip through. In case this happens, we have automated checks in our CI-CD pipeline that will prevent uploading the bad policy bundle into the S3 bucket. The next uh, case that even with the automated tests, it is still possible that a bad policy might slip through. This or any other kind of issue with the open policy agent service could cause it not to respond and uh, block people to authorize into the Kubernetes clusters. To mitigate that risk, we distribute um, administration keys to Kubernetes hosts and check kubes, uh, created uh, kubectl admin wrappers that only the system administrators can use. In the case of emergency, a handful of uh, admins will still be able to access to the Kubernetes clusters using these admin keys. In our architecture, we rely on many different systems and we implemented our architecture in a fault tolerant way. For example, if for any reason GitHub or Active Directory does not respond, we have the last frozen state of the world in the S3 bucket and system will continue to work. And if any reason S3 stops responding, we still have the last frozen state of the world cache in the OPA uh, at the Kubernetes clusters and users still continue to work, uh, continue to access Kubernetes clusters. So to conclude this talk, first I would like to talk about our shortcomings of the system. After all, nobody is perfect, right? First shortcoming is that unfortunately, not every resource has meaningful metadata in our infrastructure. So for that reason, we cannot make a team-based access decision on every resources. Although these cases are rare, uh, and, uh, but still in the future, we want to give ownership-based access to all resources to, be, uh, like to, to go all the way with the least privilege. To enforce all resources to have meaningful metadata, we are planning to use the admission controller. Another shortcoming is that the inconsistency in the authorized actors. We use OPA for uh, human resources, which are the majority of our users, but we use RBAC for the service users. So in our roadmap, we are planning to uh, migrate service users to OPA-based authorization. The next one is that the Octo authentication has one hour TTL. And to be honest, we do not consider this as a shortcoming. And in fact, from a security engineering perspective, this is actually good for our security posture. But we receive some complaints from the users that they have to enter their password every hour. The next two shortcomings that I would like to talk about here is that related to keeping the system list privilege compliant. So after we implemented the new authorization architecture, we spent a lot of time to come up with least privilege compliant capabilities. And we believe we did a good job there. But unfortunately, we do not have a system that would constantly monitor the unused permissions and drop them from the users. Additionally, Yelp is an extremely dynamic environment and people always get new, they need access to uh, new clusters all the time. And we do not have time-limited access controls uh, 
once a user get the permission they keep it anyways and addressing these issues are already in our roadmap so to conclude this talk with uh, some of our learnings I would like to first say that if you are making a fundamental shift with how you interact with a platform such as exposing more levels to people or expanding the surface area do not just bluntly carry over the security model it's important to reevaluate the security model at a major system changes like this another thing that we learned was having a well told through system design can make smooth reviewing process for security teams to get shipments from the SRE teams in fact uh, during our project, we had a very smooth reviewing process to implement such a large project. And since its inception, the server, uh, the system never malfunctioned to prevent people to access. Next is that it is totally okay to first build the tools, tools that can support the least privilege access without actually doing the least privilege rules, because doing both can be really uh, challenging. And after some time, you can actually do the least privilege setup as a follow-up. At the end of this project, we obtained the ability to give least privileged access to Kubernetes clusters based on the many parameters need and ownership. And as a result, we now have a stronger security posture by enforcing least privileged access for hundreds of teams to thousands of different Kubernetes resources. And this concludes our talk. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us today and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, Daniel, and Quentin. So we do have a couple of questions. The first one is, how long was your OPA based off Z rollout, and how large was the project build team? Yeah, hey, uh, I can take that. Um, yeah, so basically from the security team, it was the three of us that primarily worked on the project. Uh, and if I recall correctly, it was about one quarter to build out the infrastructure and about one quarter to tune the policies and get to uh, the ideal least privileged policies. Um, and we had some experience doing something very similar with our Linux infrastructure. Um, so we had a pretty solid foundation for what we needed to do and how to do it. Um, and of course, we worked with some of some other teams like the compute infrastructure team that runs the, the Kubernetes infrastructure. So it wasn't just the three of us working in a vacuum. Okay. And so now how large is the project maintenance team? Project maintenance team. I guess I would say it's the same size. Okay. It's, it's basically the same folks. And uh, any anyone else on the security team uh, who's on call or on point um, is capable of, of managing um, questions or, or support. And that team is about 10 people. Okay. All right. And for those in the audience, if you have any questions, please post them in the Slack channel. Um, I have a question for you guys. So uh, I'm wondering about the scale of data and how much you're sending to Splunk, how much you're actually retaining versus offloading, um, you know, historical reasons. So any context you want to share around that? Charlie, do you know any of that off, off the top of your head? Uh, we are, we are sending all of the uh, decision logs to Splunk, but uh, I'm not sure if you're retaining uh, extra for, for future. I think they retain about nine, uh, three months. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, I think it's 90 days of retention. Yeah, 90 uh, and we're not sure of the volume. Yep. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us.